I just want to take you back to a bit uh, history of uh, uh, our regime, our current regime. Uh, uh, this is because uh, in 2005 election, uh, it was uh, a major blow for the ruling party, for the EPRDF. Uh, how did e EPRDF came to power is one thing I want to talk about. EPRDF is formed by the uh, former uh, uh, rebel fighters, uh, first known as the Tigray People's Liberation Front. They still have that party name. And then they bring uh, f three other different groups, ethnically based. Uh, one is the Oromo, and the other is regionally based, the Amhara, and then uh, the southern region. Then they form this EPRDF as they get closer to uh, overtaking the power through armed struggle in 1991. They overthrow in 1991 as APRDF, uh, the Mengistus regime, who is now exiled in uh, living in uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, so th that's how they came to power. Uh, still, we are under EPRDF regime. So take note that uh, when I speak uh, about uh, democratization process and the free press, uh, you still have to understand that uh, the people who are be, uh, who were re former labor fighters are still on power. So how difficult it is uh, for them is uh, that shows. In 2005 uh, election, before I uh, change this slide, in 2005 election, the opposition formed a uh, coalition uh, during the last minute and then uh, they end up uh, taking uh, many seats in the parliament. And then in, in fact, uh, they were forced to go into the parliament, some denied, uh, because they said uh, we won all the election. So some of them uh, were sent to jail. And then after serving some uh, jail sentence, uh, some uh, left the country and some of them are now considered as terrorists. And they are based outside, some in the US, some uh, somewhere else in the Europe. They run a satellite TV station and they formed a, a rebel group called G7. And they are now being, uh, they're based in Eritrea. Eritrea used to be part of Ethiopia until 1991. Uh, so this is what I can say about this one. Um, and uh, there is uh, about, when it comes to media, I shot this picture uh, in Uganda in 2011, I guess, 2012, uh, I, where I served as a journalist for 10 months uh, under the fellowship of uh, FK Norway. Uh, and I was surprised to see uh, a policeman reading uh, a newspaper, a private newspaper called the Daily Monitor, which is critical about the Museveni's government. And this, uh, the guy who was sitting next to his was reading the Vision, which is a state newspaper. So uh, during that time, in, uh, it was surprising to me to see a policeman reading a private newspaper, which is critical. So I said how far we are uh, uh, from, even from Uganda, where we also see that uh, currently there is a problem with spread. That's why. So uh, the, the society now thinks that if you are from pri private press and uh, you are supposed to uh, be critical about government always and only report bad things about the government. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the opposition also thinks that uh, if you report about, let's say, uh, uh, about the construction of a new railway or something in Addis, then they consider you as if you are a propaganda machine for the government. So there is this misconception is a major challenge for a, an independent journalist to work in Ethiopia because we don't have the, the culture. The other issue is the silence of the, uh, the source. The, uh, we lack sources, independent sources when you work as a journalist. There is one side pro-government, there is one side uh, against the government. But in the middle, there is no independent voice. People who talk, who are criticizing the government now, in fact, chose to be silent because of these uh, different laws that the charity law uh, and the anti-terrorism law and the social media laws, which uh, can put you in danger. So currently, by the way, 100% of this parliament is, uh, is uh, occupied by the EPRDF party uh, after the 2015 election. Before that, in 2010 election, only one opposition was uh, in that uh, parliament. The government says that uh, we are not a repressive regime. Uh, we are uh, a fledging democracy, uh, which is uh, growing. 
so that's uh, why I, I may use the word democracy in uh, my presentation. And as a result of that, we are in self-censorship. Uh, we, 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 don't we avoid most of the issues that we should be published. Currently, there is a conflict uh, between even, in fact, the parties. Uh, whether it is real or not, uh, they are uh, fighting between the militias of the Somali region and the Oromo region militias. And then uh, there are also uh, uh, ethnic conflicts uh, which displaced many uh, hundreds of thousands of people from uh, the East area. So this all added has put us in, into not reporting such issues because we need a license from additional license to go out and report. Uh, as uh, somebody was saying uh, this morning, uh, they, they, the government invite us to their programs when they want to talk about something they want us to listen and write about it. But when we want to report, let's say somebody, uh, five or ten people died because of conflict in some part of the country. When we try to run there, we need that access. And then that will take us, like, uh, if, if they grant at all, it will take us a week, and then that will not be a story anymore for us. So these are also the issues I want to talk. Current journalism in Ethiopia as a result of this is dominated by cocktail journalism, where you go to the ho hotels and then report something uh, which has no relevance to the people on the ground and uh, which is con mostly contrary to the what's happening on the ground. And then uh, there are also pro-government news. The newspaper headline that you see here is a recent one. After this billionaire, uh, Ethiopian-born uh, Saudi billionaire who is arrested uh, by uh, the new king of Saudi Arabia, uh, the headline here says that at, a at any circumstances, uh, uh, we are with you, we are with you. It's a kind of slogan or it doesn't even look like a headline. But this is uh, the stand of the newspaper. This is because uh, this paper is a private newspaper owned by this billionaire. And then, uh, as you see, this paper is being bought and it's not reporting what it should be reporting as it is. It, they, they, they didn't know whether this guy is innocent or uh, guilty. But they said, we are with you till the last <laughs> moment. It's very funny. So uh, finally, what I can say is that, uh, uh, as I said, uh, I prepared this presentation as if I'm talking to the government officials at home back. So if this, this, uh, if this thing is distributed, I don't mind. The common objective of the government, in my view, and uh, the media is just serving the people interest uh, by uh, and democratize, uh, helping, um, speeding the democratization process of a uh, country like Ethiopia, which they said they are fighting for and they, they died for. And uh, my advice to fellow journalists is, is uh, under such circumstances, always focus on the issues and the individuals on power. That will be dangerous because uh, for the government, I say, uh, consider the media as critical, uh, media and the critical voices as partner to your fledgling democracy. So that's what I say. I think I, have, uh, I made an error by repeating partner here. So this is what I can say uh, during Q&A. I may say more about anything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to the audience for making sure to keep that. Uh Oh, uh, we're going to take questions afterwards, but we can do questions now if you had one. Yep. What I mean is that when we cover issues, uh, we focus on that issue rather than focusing on an individual who committed that uh, uh, fault. About, uh, about the issue, let's say it's about corruption in a certain uh, organization. So instead of focusing only on that person who made that uh, thing, it's better to look into the big picture and focus on the corruption and uh, its damage. Yeah. Okay, thank you.
Uh, we'll have more questions too at the end as well after we hear from everybody. But uh, let's get our second speaker is coming from to us uh, from uh, Myanmar. Um, he works for Irrawaddy. Um, I remember Irrawaddy very well when I was based in Bangkok, and we wanted to know what was going on in what was then called Burma when it was under a military regime. And Irrawaddy, which was largely based in Thailand, uh, was how we kept up with it. Uh, once uh, uh, Myanmar, Burma, now called Myanmar, opened up, Irrawaddy was able to base itself inside the country. Uh, we thought it was on a path to democratization, um, although we realize now that the military still holds great sway there. Um, I'm really glad that uh, Lawi Wang, our guest, can be here. He was actually actually spent some time in, in prison, in jail, uh, two and a half months, two, two months and six days. I think he'll tell us about his experience there when he was picked up just this year. He just got out in September, and he's here now to share his experiences with us about reporting from Myanmar. Lawi Wang. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Lewi Wen uh, from Myanmar, and we, I, I call Burma, is uh, the nearby Thailand. I'm a conflict reporter for my media, so I, I'm going to tell you about uh, my the journalist, the media condition in my country. I just came out from the prison like two months ago. Uh, the journalists who stand like ethical and principle in the country. We had like a big challenge uh, in the country, uh, like the military never have been in our side. The current government is the NAD, Aung San Suu Kyi, it wasn't in, 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 in our side either. So at the moment, it like very a few people are uh, believed on us. Um, this is the, the condition uh, in, in, um, for a reporter like who stand unethically, working like a principal, a media. And this is the uh, media landscape in, in my country. So today I, I'm telling you, and thank you for inviting me to be here. I, I'm very proud uh, to, 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 to be here. So I. Mostly, I, I'm going to tell like two issues. What is uh, happening in, in uh, my my country? One is uh, how the military and the government try to control the media, and another is uh, about the Rohingya. When the case of the Rohingya is broke out uh, in the middle of August, so international media and the, the local media they stand it were divided. So in the middle of August, there's the, uh, some um, armen attacked it in the security base from the, the government security force in Arakans. So the government issued a statement. So they would take full action to who attacked it, the security force. So the government in the issued a statement, they used it, the terrorists those who attacked it then. So they ordered the media to use, when you report uh, those attackers uh, to use a terrorist. So um, the media inside, I mean some Burmese media, they use uh, terrorists as the government said, as the military says. But the international media, like uh, Ryder, uh, AP, and uh, international media, they stand, they, do, they don't listen to the government said. So this is how they, they had to divide, they divide it in the media. So the local media, I mean the Burmese, uh, some local Burmese media uh, criticizing uh, international media do not understand a lot background of the Rohingya. So they only reported a good thing about Rohingya and the local media did not dare uh, to condemn the military action, who taking action, like the, the kick out. This is quite like international pay, very high tension. 600,000 of people fled to, to the Bangladesh. So the, the in local Burmese media did not dare to, to, to criticize it, the government and the military. So. Only the international media criticized it to the government. They said like a lot of like 
uh, how the Suji, I mean, the National League for Democracy uh, handle the case is very poor. So like she said like she would take action. That means she get a green light to the military to, to attack these people. So this uh, international criticized it a lot. And look at like, if we look at in the past, uh, before the Aung San Suu Kyi got the power, like when like we are exiled, I'm the exiled journalist, a uh, five year experience, we based in Chiang Mai. So at that time, like we are one force with the Aung San Suu Kyi, and then and the people in the country and the media are one force. But today, like when the Suu Kyi got a power, and she had a lot of supporter, and then um, the military also had their supporter too, like uh, a nationalist monk, and they own the uh, supporter too. And so we are like the journalists who stand like actually uh, minority people. So if you reported like or criticize it about Suu Kyi and they attack you. So like me, I a conflict reporter, I often travel to Arakan and to the Akhenate where they're fighting with the rebel and the Burmese army. So that's uh, how I, I, I was arrested uh, when I went to the front line of one case. Uh, on the way back, I, I took a lot of photos of where they lose the gun and uh, the rebel took it and so they lost some men. So on the way back, so they worry I'm going to upload and run the news soon. So as soon as I, I did not get uh, access to the internet area, so they, they, they arrested me and other two journalists on the way back. That's, and I want to tell that how there are still people in the country like to see uh, they are happy like I was arrested. They accused me like I'm a, re a rebel reporter who reported like good, very good thing like about rebel. And uh, I reported, like they said, like a negative thing to the, the Burmese army. That, that, that how, how, how is they, they, they accusing me. That's why I, I was arrested, I believe it, because they don't like the journalists who reported about the right abuse, such as the case of the ethnic conflict, uh, in the case of the Arakan. Um, that's uh, what I believe. And then uh, as about the censorship in our country, I uh, think that we had a political reform, like we don't have a censorship anymore. But we, we had to do a lot of our self censorship in the office because we are afraid of the military and the government. So I, I tell you, like uh, in 2015, there are really big fighting, like the, the Burmese army landed offensive, they used the uh, airstrike to the Koka uh, rebel nearby the Chinese border. So. I reported a lot, and then one day the army general called, uh, made a phone call to my editor. He said, you should tell your reporter, stop re reporting about it. Stop using quote uh, from the side of the rebel spokesperson. And then after that, like two weeks, they issued a statement, like really strong statement. They're going to take action to any media who reported about Koka fighting. So, and all we had to stop it in the country, reporting about fighting Goka. And so, it's happening like big offenses. The rebel side like, uploaded a lot of photo, how it's suffering and how they're using, how it's damaged. But we see the photo, but we, we cannot use it because it, they, they already are, we cannot use it. So, this is, uh, uh, so, what we're doing self-censorship. Re related to the censorship again, so that are uh, now what is happening, like we very hot issue, like the two article, one we call 66D, and another is the 71, that's it, the article they arrested me. I, I'm going to tell about the 66D first. The 66D is like enacted in 2013. Uh, that's it like in, since then and now like about 90 people were charged and sent them in prison. That's including uh, a journalist. So uh, you post uh, on the Facebook a message like you criticize Suji or NND or the military, or maybe you write about the case of ethnic conflict or religious conflict, conflict, and then they don't like it, they, they could arrest you. Like, or you wrote a report. This is a defamation case. So 
uh, is from two years could be sent in. So I had uh, one friend, uh, his name is Zui Win. He's an uh, uh, editor of Nyama now. So now he, how he, he posts a message about the Wiradu, the extremist monk in the country. And like he said, like this monk is like using hate speech. He did like really bad action, should not be a monk or something on the Facebook. So the, the, the supporter of the monk charged him. So until now, like he's still uh, facing, he had to go every two weeks to the court. But he got a beer so he can stay outside. But he still had to go to the, to the, to the court. So that's it, uh, 66A, and 71 Act is an unlawful association. That's it, they charged me. They charged me, they said like, I did not ask permission go into the rebel conflict uh, area. So they, they, that's it, they charged me with the article. So but in, in the constitution, I mean the media law in our country, that the journalist can travel to anywhere to the conflict area, to the fighting, and, uh, but look, uh, I mean, the, the military is still having the power, they don't care about the law. So I, I'm quite lucky, and they dropped my, the charge after I uh, stay two, two months and six days in prison, they dropped the charge. But this is uh, a lot of pressure from the international. Um, so, yeah, then uh, about the, again, so I, I, I came here, I mean, I mean to, to tell, we had a reform in the country, but there are some reform, but there are still many things we had to fight. So yeah, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I wanted to show three photos, uh, so you may have idea, like say Obama, What is this we're looking at? Uh, just the leader of the country. Uh, on this. Uh, uh, can I get a, let me go this one. I just click. This is the, the Aung San Suu Kyi and the army chief. So yeah, it, it looked like we had a reform, but uh, you, you, the she still had to deal with the, the military without the decision from the military, you know, she, she even had very bad, a hard time to deal with. This is the case of the Rohingya in the middle of August when they attacked the Brokhog, and so 600,000 of the people had to fled to the Bangladesh. So it looked like really bad. Um, this is my photo when I was in the court, so before I will release this. And yeah, thank you. That's you in the middle. Yeah, I was in the matter. Well, we're glad you're out. Thank you. That's a really interesting talk, talking about how even though there has been reforms and it's been uh, on the path to democracy, there's still some ways to go. And uh, Emin, are you ready? Our next, our third speaker here, Emin Hussein, he's a, uh, should be in Azerbaijan now, but he's actually, I guess, in exile in, uh, in Switzerland now. And he's now running the Institute for Reporters' Freedom and Safety. Um, he's going to tell us a little bit about what he's doing now. Well, you're going to tell about the situation in Azerbaijan and what you're doing now with the Institute. Thank you. Uh, since from 2001, I've started working like as investigative reporter. I'm covered economic investigations, how taxpayers' money is spent by authoritarian regime in oil rich countries, which is Azerbaijan is. And uh, until 2005, I'm continued my work as like journalist. And in 2006, I decided to establish the NGO, which is protected journalists, and also teach him how to work better and safely. And uh, uh, what's happened in my country, just I want to explain it's former uh, Republic which is part of the Soviet Union after when Soviet Union destroyed uh, we have our like independence last 26 years but still we have same system which is uh, practiced in the Soviet Union like when government used propaganda 
methodologies where government use it even not official but in a formal um, s pressure to the media outlets i mean like it's not only self censorship it's also lots of other type of pressure and uh, last 25 years i just want to tell for we have one ruling family in which is occupy ruling floor since from 90 we are just only have two years democratic elected government and in 93 when Azerbaijan the former KGB elite de facto organized coup in, in our state uh, former KGB general and uh, high level officials and former head of the Soviet Azerbaijan Republic returned to the ruling floor Heydar Aliyev since from 93 and, and to see until 2003 until he died, he stayed on the ruling floor. After, he just delivered his ruling power to his son, Ilham Aliyev. And since from 2003 until today, Aliyev stayed on the ruling floor. He changed constitution. He cut from our constitution's limits from two presidential terms. He established new, uh, he's completely destroyed balance of power and it's happened only in Azerbaijan and in the movie House of Cards. He delivered half of his presidential power to his wife. He changed constitution recently in 2016. And in f February 2017, all world observed how in Azerbaijan successfully authoritarian regime delivered half of the power from president to his own wife, which has been first lady. Now we have first lady and first vice president, which is same person. And just yesterday or two days ago, you s saw what's happened in Zimbabwe, when <laughs> even Zimbabwean ruling party not accepted for this strange practice when power delivered f inside the one family. Alif changed constitutions twice recently for his presidential terms. And after all of these unprecedented changes, talking about sometimes freedom of expression, it's quite been naive, but until 2014, we're still uh, partly free, uh, able to operate in our country. And in 2013, when Alif re-elected, which says it's not election, it's selection by himself, uh, after third, when his uh, presidential, third presidential term started, he started unprecedented uh, pressure against civil society and independent media. Even before we have a huge level of pressure against uh, independent journalists since from 2005 until today, six journalists killed. More than 200 journalists crossed from the prison system. Some of them died in the prison. Only two of them uh, in 2008 and in 2016 just die and authorities say for these journalists make suicide or die after hunger strike which is started and now for 10 million populations we have 16 critical voices in prison even we have also more than 150 political prisoners when it's different political party activists arrested with f different and fantastic charges government used against our journalists, not only defamations, government started to use, while they go, different type of fake criminal charges as like put to drugs to the pockets and arrested you as like drug dealer or arrested with your hooliganism charges. Recently, since from 2013, government start arrested independent media and independent media NGOs leaders with the power abuse, tax evasions, and illegal commercial activities when government start implement law against us and say for you guys, you are make tax evasions. And when we, all of us, which is uh, last 15 years reported about money laundering, about uh, less transparency day by day, which is we observe, when we reported how government just, which has received $150 billion from the last 12 years, take by himself $50 billion and forwarded this money out of Azerbaijan to offshore 
bank accounts. When we started reporting this, government decided for enough is enough. We, and government closed completely the door. In, in 2014, more, uh, most of the well-known journalists and human rights defenders and investigative journalists arrested. And when I look for, for example, uh, for all my colleagues still around me jailed with fake charges, I'm decided by myself for, I should protect myself for continued fight for free expression for the future. And I'm able to go to Swiss embassy in the middle of Baku and ask temporary, demo temporary diplomatic protections. And I spent like 10 months in room in Swiss embassy for this period, Swiss government, which has hosted me there, negotiated with our dictators. And finally, after 10 months, uh, it took me free and Swiss president came to Azerbaijan with federal jet and take me out directly from Baku to Switzerland. And since I was there, I'm still continuing to work there. But I'm only one lucky example. More than, I tell you before, for more than 200 journalists jailed last year, last 15 years. And uh, this is huge number from small country which is have just 10 million population. In, I spoke recently with my uh, friend from Nigeria, which is have 180 million, and it's also the same, look, it's something like this, we also have 180 million, but we just have 16 journalists in prison. But they say, for you see numbers of persons of uh, imprisoned journalists in Azerbaijan, I think more than higher in compared with other states, even with China. We don't have any free TV. Since from 2003, all independent TV is completely destroyed. We don't have public broadcasting system. We even last year's last small print independent media, it's also closed. We don't have independent print house. We don't have anything. And if you ask me, like 2000, in 2013, is it possible for it to happen in your country? I'm just saying for not, it's mission impossible. We still have partly free space, even Freedom House included our country is partly free state. But now we are in the level which is most probably unfree state, which is have uh, practice for internet blocking according to the court decision and without court decisions. We have uh, lots of uh, f f independent uh, critical voices in prison, some of them tortured. I'm tortured by myself a few times. I'm detain it. I'm not arrested from long period. And I'm just staying on isolation like 10 months. But most of my colleagues, some of them stay in the prison three, four, five years. Some of them never leave the prison again. And in 2005, uh, when most well-known journalists, Elmar Hussein, have killed in Azerbaijan, and when international pressure starts to strongly criticize uh, young authoritarian leader, which is now it's quite older, our president. Alif decided to change the tactics. He started to change, kill journalists with completely different uh, scenarios. He used like indirect methodologies for kill the journalists in prison, organizes something happened like somebody attacked journalists in the um, street. My colleague Rasim Alif, which has helped me, in 2015 with escape and which is delivered me to the Swiss embassy in Baku, he killed exactly in the same day, just one year later, in the middle of Baku, when five guys, as like which is represented himself like soccer uh, fanats, killed him, beat him, and he died in the hospital, in the same hospital when two years ago, another journalist, which is also cut by knife, but not die die in the same hospital, in the same room, just two years before. And that's how governments use health system or security forces, just somebody beat the journalist, and issues continued and finished it in the hospital by the doctors or uh, secret agents. But now, with, uh, I think I already spent my 10 minutes, I just want to talk uh, briefly about uh, this young guy. This is my uh, brother, which is start work with me when he's just like 18 years old. He worked 
with me until he's jailed, he decided, I'm decided for myself to leave the country and make some kind of mechanism outside for uh, protect my, somehow protect my staff and friends and colleagues in Azerbaijan, establishing NGO outside Azerbaijan because since from 2014, foreign funding completely uh, prohibited in Azerbaijan and in this situation, some of the people decide to don't leave Azerbaijan. And this is one of the guy, which is my brother. He's an investigative blogger, which is most of the famous critical faces in the country. It's maybe some of you uh, from so post-Soviet uh, countries know that guy like Alexei Navalny from Russia, which is have millions uh, followers in YouTube. And my brother have same numbers of uh, followers in internet. It's approximately 30% of all internet users followed him in Azerbaijan. And finally, when government tortured him, tried to negotiate it with him and say, for you should implement self-censorship. When it's not accepted, and it's not accepted to left the country, he's arrested. And now he's arrested just maybe with simple, with simple defamation case, but he's arrested for two years. So, in he at here, I want to just stop my presentation. I am already spoke 13 minutes, and if we have questions, I will. Great. Thank you very much. It's rather depressing. Actually, three somewhat depressing <laughs> talks we've heard from... Uh, Ethiopia, Myanmar, and Azerbaijan. Um, I should have uh, said at the outset, too, apologies. We, uh, one of our speakers is not here. That's Elena Milashina uh, from Russia. Um, there's nothing nefarious. She wasn't stuck there. She actually just hurt her back and couldn't travel. Um, so you, please, uh, you can ask any questions for any of the panelists here from Ethiopia, from Azerbaijan, from uh, Myanmar. You can ask me about China or anything in Southeast Asia as well, if you would like. Or you might just want to share, share your own ideas or your own thoughts. Yes. Thank you very much. Microphone. You can just shout if you have a good voice. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say something concerning the country I, that I come from. Um, I come from South Sudan. <laughs> And when I saw here that this afternoon we are going to talk about reporting under repressive uh, regions, and there is none to talk about where I come from. As I'm talking right now, I'm a journalist in a country that is, we are talking about repressive. When it's like in our country, in my country, the government have eyes all over the country. Recently, one of uh, three journalists were sent by an organization to go and do a documentary in one of the states. Before they could even get a single information, they did not ask for their IDs or who they are. They were just grabbed and taken nowhere. Nobody knows where they are. Until when we realized that they were sent from that state to Juba, that is the capital city, and they are in cell. That's one. Two, very many media houses are being closed down. As long as you speak anything small that the government has done and it's negative thing, your media house is being closed. And as I'm talking, most of the, um, the international medias are sent out of the country. We do not have them anymore there. When you go to the field, the moment people see you with a recorder in the street, someone has to come and say, I am a CID. He will not show you his ID. He will just grab your camera or your recorder. And he calls people. It's either a convoy that comes and takes you, of which nobody will know where they are taking you. OK? So, it's, it's very hard. You cannot ask him or tell him, because me, I've gone through this. I was at a school, 
and uh, we were taking the picture and I was planning to do uh, a story on peace, schools having peace clubs because our country is not in peace at the moment. Mm -hmm. So these guys did not ask what we are doing or who we are and why we are doing this. He just came and took our cameras and the recorders and said, you are the people who are reporting bad things about our country. You are the people who are saying that we do not have food, the country is not in good condition. And the truth is, yeah, the country is not in good condition for those of you who have heard about South Sudan. So when you were talking about this topic, I was like, this is what I really wanted to hear from other countries, how it's like, thank you. you did you work for a television or a newspaper? I work for a radio and television. Radio and television. Yes. Sadly, that situation is common in many places, not yeah. just in South Sudan. We've yeah. heard the same situation before. It's very difficult, especially if you take, as you mentioned, if you take out recording equipment. Thank and you. It, yeah. Thank you very much for that. Uh, in the back, back there. Was it? Okay. Uh, we'll get one here first, then the gentleman in the back. Uh, back there. Hi, I'm Sonia Sarkar. I uh, work with the Telegraph newspaper back in India. Mm -hmm. Let me briefly tell you, I mean, I, as I have been hearing all these stories, I mean, they sound so familiar. Earlier, you know, three, four years back, we all just thought, of, oh, really bad for these countries. But now when I hear these stories, I, I see that that's exactly what's happening back in India in the past two, three years since uh, like in, nine, uh, in 2014 when BJP government, the Hindu uh, group, uh, which took over and Narendra Modi became That's the That's interesting because we see India yeah. as a free country. Yeah, terms. exactly. You know, let me tell you how free it is now. Like, I, <laughs> I, what I, I mean, I seriously, when I'm hearing stories from Burma, from Ethiopia, it's like, oh, I mean, similar things are happening back home. So what is happening, let me briefly tell you, is like is, there's huge division in the media now. And there's a section of media which is working as the propaganda machinery of the state. And there's another section which is like, which uh, consists of very, very s small number of journalists who are actually taking on the state. There's a lot of self-censorship that's happening, but people who are taking on the sta state are being branded as anti-nationals by these, you know, the, by the other section of the media, which is the saddest thing. Th such divisions uh, were, uh, didn't exist earlier. Uh, but I have a question for uh, the representative from Burma. I mean, do you think, like, when while you were reporting on the military regime in the on the military junta for all these years and the atrocities uh, 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 that they had unleashed, in the entire process of talking about the uh, violence unleashed by military junta, do you think you made a hero out of Aung San Suu Kyi too early? And now she's actually behaving exactly like what the military junta uh, was doing all this while. I mean, is this, is this some sort of uh, error in judgment, error of judgment by media? Good Thank question. Did we, did we make a mistake? Talk about the international press and the Burmese press. Uh, she, I mean, she wasn't uh, act like a military, but the problem is like, what is the different from the past and the current is like, uh, the her supporter, Aung San Suu Kyi's supporter, like majority of people in the country supported her. And they don't dare to criticize it, her anymore. I mean, even the military. In the past, they criticized it a lot, even the media in the country criticized the military a lot. Now is they, they said like, if they criticized Suu Kyi, that will hurt it, her government, and then it also related to the military bad relationship. So it, it very hard. Like your question is like, what if she is like acting at the same military? Uh, is no, no. Thank you for that. By the way, while you're speaking, I was finding the Reporters Without Border, the, the Borders uh, Press Freedom Map, uh, so you could see the areas, uh, uh, the areas in black are just basically absolutely, they, you know, nothing there. But in red, is pretty bad as well, and uh, and the the numbers are getting worse and worse. And if you go to, um, oops, sorry, if you go to their uh, the list of countries, North Korea is bad. Eritrea is. 
uh, number 179, Turkmenistan, Syria, China, Vietnam, and there's your country, Sudan. So, that's Sudan. That's that, that South Sudan. Then, then they have uh, Cuba is not there, Djibouti, Saudi Arabia, a lot of the Middle Eastern countries. 162 is Azerbaijan, so not too good. Hmm? Eritrea is way down at 179, so Eritrea is worse than Ethiopia, it's according to this. Uh, okay, <laughs> you don't want to be at the end of that list. You want to be at the top. But <laughs> sorry, uh, the gentleman in the back has been waiting. Yeah, uh, or a question. Hello, my name is Pong Pan from Thailand. Uh, my question go to Lawi Weng. Uh, after you and your colleague got arrested because of a uh, tech coverage on the ethnic uh, ethnic armed group in border area. Uh, after you got released, what is your best practice to uh, cover it of the ethnic armed force again? Uh, I will go back to the armed conflict area again. But I mean, like, I had to be careful a lot. I mean, now I, I learned it, like, what I, should, I could do and what I could not do it. But the best thing is to to understand like when they lost in the battle, so you have to be careful when you come back. So you need to avoid the way you come back and then like, change, change. Maybe today you go back, maybe you change, delay, stay in the jungle two days. Maybe you will come back later. So yeah, it's it, it quite hard, I mean, to deal with these people, but you, I'm a conflict reporter and so I, I cannot avoid any such a like uh, scary thing, and so I I had to keep going to the conflict area. So the best thing is that what I said, I need to learn when they really hard in the battle, they lost the gun, they lost their man, and so be careful. <laughs> so those type of the uh, video or the photo, like as soon as you get it, and then and get internet access and uh, send it to your office. That is how I did in the past. But this time is, is really bad luck for me. That's a village where I went. It, it does not have any phone access or internet. So the military, they know it. So that's why they're waiting on the road. Uh, so they will get my photo, anything, what I took it from the front line. So yeah, I, that's a bad luck. Yes, um, this question is for Andwalam. Um, so you mentioned the challenges that you face uh, as a reporter in Ethiopia. So I'd, I'm curious to know how do you then practice journalism in Ethiopia yourself and um, colleagues who are in similar situations? As I said, uh, it's difficult for any journalist to be critical about the government. Uh, what you do is just report on this cocktail journalism and conference journalism most of the time. If you have the gig, the gut, the gut, uh, then you go out of your way sometimes and do critical things in a way that uh, will not offend them. You know, when you stay in the system, when your friends are arrested, you know why they are arrested, which issue is sensitive to the government, which issues are not sensitive. So you focus on those issues that you think is not dangerous. Sometimes it happens to, you happen to be in a dangerous situation which they thought that it was a festive, uh, let's say for instance in my case for last year, there was this Oromo festive uh, session where all foreign media correspondents including me were invited to cover that festive, festival. But that festival uh, ended up into violence and uh, we were sitting, recording and everything. So uh, people died, uh, we didn't get those pictures at that time, but I was recording and I was one of, uh, I, I was recording video and at the same time taking pictures of the military with guns, with bombs and everything that they are packed and uh, I posted that on social media, one of the first posters with, were my photos and then uh, from VOA in Washington, uh, a former colleague called me that I saw your picture, so can you t describe the situation? Then I described the situation uh, that uh, at that moment, uh, after that, uh, 
uh, the security guys start to looking uh, for me and uh, some started calling me and some started following me, uh, which is uh, annoying because this is uh, the issue that uh, they should, I shouldn't be doing if they didn't allow me to, they didn't invite me to cover that. But I didn't do a story. What I've done is just that the situation turned into ugly and something like this. So I posted that thing. But I made my observation to the VOA journalist that I saw what I saw from the, uh, the first day evening when we arrived and whatever I saw and uh, I described it. But they didn't like that one. So, so you avoid what you don't want to report. And uh, in my case, when I avoid, I have to make a living. So I do something else, like uh, business intelligence for companies or do research uh, on business specific sector. And I have my own means of sustaining my life. But because I love journalism and I want to stay in my country, I still uh, try to uh, focus on the issues that matter. Let's say, uh, for instance, the case of uh, recent, my recent in-depth report on the industrial parks, which pays low wage for the employees. That opportunity, I cannot report in depth if the government did not invite us. So I use that opportunity. When they invite you, you go in depth. Uh, they don't want you to talk to your employees mm -hmm. because they pay less than a dollar a day, which is uh, uh, not fair, I mean, for anybody. So uh, we use our own means and techniques, and sometimes we go uh, byline. We don't use our byline. We collaborate with other reporters. Uh, so you have your own means of uh, working. Can I just add, because uh, from my years as a foreign correspondent for the Washington Post, whenever I reported from Ethiopia or, or Myanmar or any of these other countries, the worst that I thought ever would happen to me would be I'd get kicked out and never allowed back in. But it's the reporters who want to cover their countries, who live in those countries, who are really risking jail uh, more than foreign correspondents. Foreign correspondents do get arrested, but in general, what happens to us? You know, I've been, I was barred from Myanmar for 10 years. I've been kicked out of a lot of different countries, but I never really worried too much because I thought the worst that would happen would be I would be kicked out. You guys get arrested, so that's, that's the big difference. Yes? Um, I'm, my name is Alison, and I'm a journalist from China, and I uh, reporting political oppression and uh, resistance movements. So actually, um, my, my situation and my other college situation are uh, very dangerous and we working underground uh, mostly. And so I want to ask two questions. The first one is for our uh, journalists from Azerbaijan. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, another question is for our professor. The first, uh, the first question is, that uh, as the chairman of the uh, reporters' freedom and safety, what what can you do for the journalists like me or the other journalists uh, who are put in jail? Uh, is your work working? And uh, and the other question is that uh, professor, as the China as China is so like powerful and. It even began to censor, uh, censor the uh, publishers and media in the other country, like uh, the Cambridge uh, publisher and yeah, the other academic publisher. So uh, what do you think about this um, phenomenon and uh, what can the world do about that? Yeah, thank you. Um. As for journalists, which is still continue to work in Azerbaijan and uh, work in the independent media outlets. When I say for, we don't have any more independent regular traditional media, but we still have independent online medias, which is staff represented in Azerbaijan, but main headquarters stay outside the f in, uh, country. We try to cover it legal assistance from imprisoned journalists from killed journalists, from any uh, victims uh, in Azerbaijan and also outside of Azerbaijan because uh, repression happened not only in country, also outside of the country. It's recently my colleagues kidnapped in the middle of the uh, neighbor 
uh, capital in Georgia, and he's delivered it illegally. He's arrested illegally, detained, and delivered it to the Azerbaijan. Uh, we are organized for people like him, international awareness campaign. We are uh, quite, we have long-term experience with international advocacy from free expression, and sometimes it's quite successful. Normally, if it's quite uh, strong and clear case, we able to find solutions for journalists as like make international campaign for him and after this government releases them. Uh, yes, we are not able to help to all these people. Uh, sometimes we just tell to our advice, if you have any risk to the journalists, uh, to your life, you should leave the country. Some of people decide to stay even and we make risk assessment, we make investigations, like if some uh, journalist harassed it or somebody want to kill him, and he say, oh, I have this situation, we try to uh, protect him. We, are, or we have few cases when we provided uh, support for the journalist like for 10 months, for the one and a half years. It's, uh, but yeah, we just independent media watchdog. And since from 2014, just we have less resources because we don't have funding. We have very limited funding when most of the donors decide to stop to operate in the country. Because as this donor says, like, with it, this donor community, like international organization, don't make m risk for us. Because when it supported us, we strongly continued our work, which is, I think, wrong uh, theory because Donors should support people which is continued uh, fight for human rights and other rights in his own state, even if it drives risk things. Thank you. And in answer to your second question to me, I mean, it's, uh, you're very brave <laughs> to be a journalist in China these days. I mean, I teach a lot of mainland, uh, journal mainland students who come to Hong Kong to study journalism, and a good chunk of them do not want to go back to China. <laughs> they want to stay in Hong Kong or work in the, you know, the Western press based out of Hong Kong to cover China by going in and out, but not living in China because they recognize the restrictions. According to uh, the uh, the map I just had up from uh, Reporters Without Borders, you saw China was black. It means the situation for journalists there is about as bad as it could possibly be. In terms, and and you're absolutely right. As China has become stronger, they're actually now starting not only to repress the media and the press within China, but trying to stop the, uh, you know, outsiders, you know, publishers from, like the Cambridge University Press and others. Uh, the problem, what can the world do? The problem is the world is just making a decision that they'd rather deal with China, you know, because of its economic power and its clout on the world stage than push for human rights. And um, it was pretty distressing uh, to watch the visit recently from President Trump who got the red carpet treatment, they gave him tea at the, at the Forbidden City, they treated him like a king. And you notice that the, 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 arguably the two most powerful men in the world, Donald Trump and Xi Jinping, sat there and they had all these meetings and they sat in front of, they didn't answer one question from the media. Not a single question from the press. And later on, when the White House was asked why didn't Trump give a press conference or say anything, the, uh, his answer was, oh, because the Chinese didn't want it. Now, that was outrageous to me because when Barack Obama went in 2009, he insisted on having a, a press conference with Hu Jintao, then the president, and the Chinese said, no, we don't want it. And then Obama said, well, then I'll go out myself and give a press conference if you want. And so, so they insist. And, you know, for example, when Obama went uh, to China, just as comparison, and when Jimmy Carter, uh, I'm sorry, Bill Clinton went to China, they always insisted on talking to students at universities. And the, the Chinese would say, no, we're not going to allow that. And they said, okay, well, we won't do the trip. So you can put pressure on them if you want to. Unfortunately, we seem to have a U.S. administration now that has downgraded human rights. Um, they put America first. Everything is transactional. It's about trade. And they don't seem to care. Um, likewise, with the British, the Europeans, it's all about trade. It's all about leveraging China's economic clout. If the world got together and decided that this was important and they were going to put pressure on China, um, to you know, alleviate the situation for journalists, then it might work. But at the moment, it seems to be the exact opposite, particularly, I see it only getting worse at the moment as America is retreating from the world, as America is pulling back into this America first policy, you're starting to see countries around the region in, in Asia, for example, like, like Cambodia, starting to say, well, we're gonna go with China. <laughs> 
You know, you might even uh, at some point start saying Thailand is starting to say, hey, we might as well go with China. So I think it's a really bad situation now for the press. The only thing we can do at the moment, what we can do to help you, is only just to try to publicize the plight of Chinese journalists as much as we can. We can support organizations like Reporters Without, uh, with, uh, Reporters Without Borders, Reporters Sans Frontières. We can support organizations like uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists, CPJ. But it's very, very limited. You know, the Foreign Correspondents Club in Hong Kong which is Hong Kong is still this one little corner of somewhat free media in China, although booksellers are getting abducted over the border. We can still put out statements condemning the treatment of our colleagues, our Chinese colleagues across the border, but there's not a whole lot anybody can do unless the, you know, the governments that trade with China and that interact economically are willing to do something. Any more questions here? Yes, or comments? Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Uza Mayeha Peter. I'm from South Africa, I'm a student journalist here at Wits University. And um, my question is, you know, like South Africa isn't, we, we don't really have the same stories as the narratives that have been presented today, but um, how do we as young journalists sort of preserve that culture and ethos of making sure that what we report is reliable and what we report is, is ethical because even though we, we, we don't have very severe like instances that we can relate to you guys and your countries, there are some aspects where we, we hear that certain media houses are propaganda machinery. So how do we avoid getting to a state, to a situation where journalists are you know, not seen or considered to be as valuable? How do we maintain the ethos of journalism? So you have a, you have a relatively free press. How do you keep it? How do you, yes. how do you maintain what you've got? Any any thoughts? So for Azerbaijani journalists, now we have two realities. Like, wrote something which is completely unacceptable for the ruling regime and takes dangers for you and for your family or accept some kind of informal deal with the government and still like continue it like soft journalism. Most of the journalists accepted second way. When it's like only few, like maybe it's few, maybe 20 or 30 journalists in Azerbaijan. We have 3,000 journalists, only 30 of them. Uh, it's like from groups, very small group of uh, people which is believe well, he should continue uh, his important missions. Even if he has the funds or don't f have the funds. It's like his type of the uh, style of his life. And uh, it's very limited space o also for operations. It's no place, uh, even, even independent media outlets have very limited resources to recruit new j young journalists. We have a uh, universe which is produced like 300 journalists per uh, year, there's no one from them, maybe one or two person continue to work as like journalist. And this is a serious problem. And when I'm talking about like independent or investigative journalism in Azerbaijan, unfortunately it's like only 30 persons, which is strongly continued work systematically. S every year we have like five, six cases when well-known journalists decide to leave the country. But also hopefully we have the hopes for every year five or six young journalists, also like my young brother, join to the system. But it's very limited space with, uh, with I mean, with, uh, we don't have resources for developed independent media. And in this condition, we still continue to operate it. That's why I don't know how I'm correct response to your questions, but again, it's only two way. And other journalists just received uh, funds from the state, even president, in Azerbaijan, uh, give us like gift from uh, journalists. Every year, 300 journalists received flats from the president. You see, before each elections, president just gives a kiss. Yeah, I'm support freedom of expression. You are very brave guys, and he shares his keys. We already have 600 journalists with, for last uh, three years received 600 flats, and president share in everywhere for, yes, we are support the media. That's why it's difficult. We have the slogan, it's easily to stay stronger in front of the tank or the weapons, 
But it's not easy to stay when somebody want to buy you with money. That is, and this is principle. If you are not accepted this. And I've clicked on every country except Azerbaijan here. <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> like Azerbaijan, it's small. This small. Stay, you see? Just click on it. Which one? Click, if you click on it, it'll come up. Ah, he found it first time. Look at that. I clicked on every country around it. When, uh, and we have to, we're a little bit over time, but we started late, so we'll take one more question, if anybody, or a comment, or... I know this has been a depressing panel of sorts. Hello? Sir. Uh, Sir, where are you? My name is Zain Rumaswa. Ah, so all the way back there. Yes. <laughs> all right, I'm you a, get the last word. Yes, I'm a freelance journalist from Uganda. Uh, we it's sad to hear from our colleagues in those countries, some of which are really run by rogue governments. Uh, I attended one of the sessions, and this time it was on another topic, but I was impressed by one Zimbabwean lady. Uh, she pointed out so many problems being faced. This was that journalists are being actually besieged. Uh, by economic problems, some editorial offices are really compromised by money, and she just said that all we do, we will work and against all those. I'm just asking some of the journalists, uh, one from South Sudan, another from Burma, who are really working under terrible conditions. Uh, I mean, Burma is really a problem because it's ruled by somebody who suffered under the same problems, that lady Suki. Can you just briefly give, they give, give us one of their survival, some of their survival tactics? Maybe some of them have taught the journalist population or workers, they have totally given up or what? Do they have any survival tactics to work in those countries as journalists? or they have really got out of hand. Thank you very much. Okay, do you have any survival tactics or advice to give people? It's, uh, it's very individual. I can't advise you anything if I'm not been in your country. I'm, even if I know a lot of things about lots of problematical country. Again, if I'm not in the country, I'm not able to explain what is possible to. In a country like Azerbaijan, we have just one general advice. You should care about yourself. Don't trust to anyone. Uh, when you s one of the person here say for government have eyes in everywhere. In Azerbaijan, it's completely uh, strong uh, IT uh, observations and also video surveillance in around whole country, even in the, in the region. We, it's Azerbaijani government used like most expensive equipment to tracking whole populations like with car plates, even uh, five states in the world have just cheaped car plates. When you travel with which uh, uh, directions, which, which speed, it's, uh, it's definitely recorded in online regimes, five different agencies uh, organize video surveillance with uh, artificial intellect, which is a face recognition system. But even with this, we have concrete advice for Azerbaijani journalists. It's easily find solution if you want to just change your uh, face or, or make like some technical problem for broke this system, which is try to follow at you. And, uh, and if you want to just escape, you should always uh, care about yourself. Don't never believe in my personal opinions. When, for example, I want to escape to my uh, international, uh, to international organization, try to help me with escape. With international group came to Azerbaijan, says for you should go there, there, there. We are made encrypted communications. But still, in the last moment, I decide to make everything by myself. And I'm t it's true, uh, Stead, because w if I listen to these guys, which is came, one of them comes from Russia, another one comes from France, 
I'm immediately arrested just in front of the door of the embassy. That's why in, in any cases you should decide by yourself. No one knows better how you should uh, take care about yourself. That is, you just need to think about this and double check all risks. Uh, we we believe uh, like a lot of like sometimes like you will have like good luck maybe you always had a good luck but luck sometimes you really had bad I mean sometimes you won't have a good luck every time so the what we travel in the jungle like to the front line is the best thing is you, you take a motorbike take a motorbike is quite easy to travel instead of the car the car is, like is very difficult some small road. They can block you quite easy, or you, when you see something strange. They, they, so if you have a motorbike, you see, you just turn it back. And then, um, so, but don't tell like, uh, where you ran a motorbike, I'm going to travel to the jungle. So I, I make it one time, like, the, like almost a week, I ran a motorbike, and then and he lost his motorbike. One day I came out to the jungle, he said, well, I thought I, you took away my motorbike, you stole it. No, no, I came out from the jungle, I tell him. Oh, so you are a journalist. So firstly, don't tell him. So that's how we're dealing with But when I was arrested, I was arrested on the car and with other people too. So when you travel, it, travel yourself is the best way. Uh, uh, with your photographer and uh, you and drive, but uh, you have to travel with the with the car and there are other people, and then and so the photo where uh, my camera memory card I I, I hide it already, but when they found the photo is to the another journalist, so because of him for example it I had to blame, I really careful I had experience but the problem is they found it photo from another journalist, so I was arrested. The same condition. So the, the best thing is travel your set, took a motorbike, hide it. Sometimes you may sleep in the jungle one night or two night, come back later. Don't come back at the same time that you're fighting because they are really serious. Because they lost their man, they lost their gun, and they're really angry about it, the condition. They will wait you in the middle of the road. Yeah, and so I think maybe I spend one night, two nights. And then I come back later when the, the, the situation is stable. That's how the best thing to deal with. Uh, yeah. And then on your wallet, or on your phone, don't, don't take the photo with the rebel or a business card, don't, don't hide in the, your wallet. And keep it in somewhere where they cannot find it. Because when they see you, a journalist, uh, uh, going to the rebel conflict uh, area, or maybe come back and they check wallets first the phone number, the number, or what you had, or the address card. And then they check the phone, well, what you had. It. So delete it, all the things, and your wallet is um, make, make sure, no address, anything. So that's uh, how I, I'm dealing with in the country. The case of uh, Rohingya, I mean, I, I mentioned like religious conflict, is really difficult to deal with the condition because of like, there's the Buddhist side and there's the Muslim side. The Buddhist is the majority, right? So they don't trust you because they know when you land in Arakan, you are going to go to the uh, Rohingya side, I mean the Muslim side. And then they monitor monitoring you every step. So make sure before you arrive in that area, you make a phone call. I made, I made a phone call from my office, get a contact to the ground who can take you, sneak to the side of the, the Rohingya. And so make it sure, don't drive in the public. So hide it maybe somewhere and then and go it. So normally I take a taxi. I, I told them I, I just visit to somewhere in the university nearby the area. And then I sneak out, I just walk. And then when I get in that side, I call my friend, pick me up, I on this side. That's how I'm dealing with. So get a, don't put any business cards in your pocket, get a motorcycle, be ready to sleep in the jungle, and let your office know where you are. And last word to Ethiopia here. Okay, I don't know if it works, it works for you, but uh, my strategy is just confuse them. Uh, don't associate yourself with either the ruling party or the opposition. You just stay independent as a journalist and don't associate yourself with anyone. So that's the way how you should be safe a bit. <laughs>
And as the moderator, I'll just add, protect your sources. I'll tell you one story. We had a correspondent who was leaving Beijing. He packed up all of his belongings. Uh, he got to the other end, back to the United States. He realized that someone had gone in and taken out all of his notebooks and photocopied them. So he panicked all of a sudden. But fortunately, he had done what you're supposed to do, which is he disguised all the names. So everyone he had interviewed, he gave them a fake name, or he used initials, or he used something. But the, they had gone through every one of his notebooks and photocopied them. So that's the, other, that's the other lesson. If you're leaving a country like China, you have notebooks, hand carry them. Don't put them in your, in your uh, checked luggage, or don't put them in your cartons to be boxed out. Uh, can we have a big round of applause for our brave journalists who came here to talk? Andualem, Emin, Bobby Wang. And I want to thank you guys. You guys are really brave, too, coming from everywhere. You guys give yourselves a round of applause. China, South Sudan, everywhere. 